We welcome you to the program today. The title of the lesson, Ransom and Redemption. The words ransom and redemption describe our deliverance from sin. Today, let's look at these terms as used in the Bible. We begin with the meaning of redemption. The concept of redemption was used in ancient warfare, with the victor capturing the vanquished as spoil, later to give demands for their release. The sum paid for release was the ransom, while the one who carried out the process was the redeemer. Literally, redemption is the act of taking back or buying back. In the 14th century, the English word was used for deliverance from sin. Jesus and his disciples used related terms of ransom and redemption in order to paint a picture to humanity of our salvation. To redeem is to free from captivity by payment of ransom, while a ransom is the price of redemption. A kidnapper might snatch away a child, hold the child captive, and demand a ransom for release. With the child being unable to deliver self, the parents may redeem the children by paying the ransom. We might use the expression today, someone is willing to pay a king's ransom, meaning a very large sum of money. In the gospel, we learn that the king of kings paid the ransom for our sins. Second, let's note the application of redemption. Jesus is pictured as our redeemer. By practicing sin, we became captive to sin. According to Jesus in John 8, 34, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. While some people view themselves as free in the practice of sin, is this really the case? Is there true liberty? While one is free to make choices in life, whether good or bad, ultimately we will answer for those in the judgment. We learn this lesson from the book of Ecclesiastes. Know that we will answer. In reality, according to what Jesus taught, instead of having liberty and being free, we're actually slaves of sin as we commit sin. Jesus is said to have come to, to free, to give liberty to the captives. Unable to deliver ourselves, Jesus, who loves us, paid the ransom to set us free. The name Jesus means Savior. What was the ransom that Jesus paid to deliver us from sins? Jesus came, according to Luke 19.10, to seek and to save that which was lost. And according to Matthew 20, 28 and Mark 10, 45, to give his life a ransom for many. Here you have Jesus, not only as the great redeemer, but also as the ransom for our redemption. And so he came to save the lost, to give his life a ransom for many. In Paul's epistles, we learn in 1 Timothy 2, 5 to 6, how that Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. Again, in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave himself. What more could he give? Paul also wrote in Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And so we have 
in Jesus, redemption through his blood. Well, what does that mean? We learned earlier that the term redemption, the act of buying back the forgiveness of sins is obtained through the blood of Christ. It says, according to the riches of his grace, it's not a matter of earning one's salvation, but that we have this gift through the grace, the unmerited favor of God. Now, that doesn't mean that, that there are not things that we must do. In fact, we learn in Hebrews that Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. It's not a matter of earning salvation. It's simply of doing as God has said to do. As he, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say to do? If we are to profess him as the Lord Jesus Christ, then certainly we ought to submit to his authority as such. Colossians 1, 13 to 14, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Again, it's through his blood that we have the forgiveness of sins, redemption. And so Jesus gave himself a ransom we have in his sacrifice, redemption. What is the reason? Why did he do so? Well, we noted his love. In Titus 2, 13 to 14, it says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. And so we look for the hope, we look for the glorious appearing of Christ and his second coming. Note how Paul describes Jesus. Is he simply the son of a carpenter, Joseph? No. Is he simply a, a wise man? Is he just a, a good man? Paul says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we see his deity, that he is God, and he is our Savior. No other name given among men by which we must be saved. And so in this act of redemption, Jesus gave himself so that he might redeem us giving his own blood for our redemption. Redeem us from every lawless deed, and so from all iniquity, sin. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1.19, we were not redeemed with silver and gold. Perhaps if we're talking about a prisoner being redeemed, perhaps if Ransom might be produced in order to redeem him or set him free to buy him back. Silver or gold might be produced as the ransom, but is silver and gold sufficient to redeem the soul? As Peter wrote, we were not redeemed with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. First Peter 1.19. Sometimes people may say, well, I'm not I'm too bad. I'm, I'm too bad a person to be saved. But what does that say about Jesus as the ransom and redeemer? Is his blood not precious enough? Not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ? And what about for the world? Precious enough to do the to to do the act of redemption but also not just for one, but for everyone. Potentially, everyone could be saved. Unable to redeem ourselves, Jesus paid the ransom for redemption. 
He did so because of his love for humanity. In Romans 5, 6 to 8, Paul wrote to the church at Rome. He said, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We think about it, the condition that humanity was in. When we were still without strength, without strength, weak, unable to deliver ourselves in due time. And so at the right time, Christ, the anointed of God, Christ died for the ungodly. Again, someone might die for, for a godly person, but what about the ungodly? Jesus died for everyone. Not that another sacrifice would be sufficient. It would not. But the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God. In due time, he died, it says, for the ungodly. For scarcely or rarely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. So someone might dare to die for a good man. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so Christ did not simply die for his friends or for those who loved him. He shows his love in that he died for us while still sinners, while still without strength. Note that he includes himself. You think about Paul or Saul prior to his conversion. He once persecuted Christians because he thought he was doing what was right. It wasn't until he saw the resurrected Lord before he realized how wrong he had been and was told to go into the city and it would be, be told what he must do, must do to be saved. And so Ananias told him to rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. And Paul was baptized. After which we see that the Lord revealed to him uh, the gospel. We see how that he went out preaching the word uh, despite the persecution that he faced. But we see that even Paul could be saved. And that's the argument that he uses in his epistles, that if he could be saved, anybody could be saved. Anybody who will repent of their sins can be saved. God shows, he demonstrates his own love toward us. What more could be done? The precious blood of Christ. Not just for one, but for all. Not just for those who love him. But for everyone, even those who hate him, despise him, again, potentially everyone can be saved if they will believe the gospel. They will obey the word. Do you believe the gospel, the good news? If you were a captive, a prisoner, and if someone on the outside, could produce a ransom in order to redeem you, to set you free. You would be, you would be so overjoyed knowing that until they produce the ransom that you're, you're without hope. But the good news may come that someone has produced the ransom and that you're set free. That would indeed be good news. We consider humanity and lost in sin. And when you consider yourself lost in sin, knowing that you have sinned and that you're lost in sin, but believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that he died for your sins, that is good news. The good news of redemption in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for you. 
if you believe in him with all your heart, as we see in Acts 8, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, uh, that he is the son of Christ, that he is the Christ, the son of God, and be baptized for the remission of your sins, the forgiveness of your sins. It is the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. Will you believe and obey the gospel? Remember Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Mark 16, 15 to 16. Do you believe the gospel? It may be that you are already a Christian, but you have been unfaithful. There is still hope. Repent of your sins and turn to God in prayer. We encourage you to continue to seek the Lord in all that you do. And we're glad that you were here today to hear the message. We hope that it has been beneficial. Until next time.